to you this morning. I've titled the message, Are We Ready for War? So, you know, we touched on what's going on with Russia and Ukraine and Israel and Hamas. And how, how many of us have been following all that's been going on in those two regions? We, we are pretty lucky that we live here in North America. You know, most of us, I could look in the room and I could say most of us probably haven't experienced war on North American soil in our lifetimes, have we? But if you've been following what's been going on in, Euro in Europe and the Middle East, some people are even speculating that we might see war on North American soil. There's big predictions of World War III and, and such going on through the news and media, social media. Can make us feel a little uneasy at times. <clears throat> so the other week, three weeks ago, I had a great privilege. I got to baptize my youngest daughter as she came to know our Lord and Savior. I also got to do the same for my oldest daughter a couple years back. So I'd like to ask, how many people here have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior? You can just show with your hands if you feel comfortable. Almost everybody. So the reason why I ask this is oftentimes we can get caught up in the stuff that I had mentioned to us before about Russia, Ukraine, World War III possibly. But Seeing as I've seen pretty much all hands up, we've all accepted Christ. Do you realize that we have actually been at war the whole time since we've accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior? Each and every day, we are out on the battlefield. Now, I'm not talking about a war where we have tanks and jets and um, Navy vessels. I'm talking about a spiritual warfare that's happening every day, the moment we wake up till the moment we go to bed. See, when we accepted Christ, we accepted a commission in his military, essentially. And he gives us a commission. And that commission, we can find in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 20. You guys don't have to turn there. I can just read that for us real quick. And it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So that is our commission the day we accepted Christ and joined his military. And I don't want to take anything away from the brutalities that are going on across the world. Not just Ukraine and Israel, but, you know, in Yemen, there's Syria, there's conflicts. We talked about Congo. There's conflicts all over the world. And I'm not taking anything away from those. But we cannot sit back in our comfy couches and watch what's going on in the world and worry if it's coming here. How much worse is it that we know that lots of our family and friends could end up in hell for eternity if they died tomorrow. So now we've established that we are at war. Where do we think this war is being fought? Maybe in the bars in town? Skid Row? You know, we may fight some battles there from time to time. But those places and many others are already strongholds of Satan, and we will fight battles there. But the place where Christians are going to be fighting most of our battles is right here in our churches, in our homes. An example is my oldest daughter who I brought with me today. We like to go for bike rides all through Edmonton. We go downtown, I take her White Ave, I take her all over the place. You just, I don't know if you guys go to downtown Edmonton, but just about every church that we drive by, you know what they fly in their church? A gay pride flag. What an abomination. You know, they fly that flag 
and it has a total different meaning than what God's Word tells us it means. And to me, that's a clear indicator of Satan battling in our churches and winning. So, in war, you try and gain ground, and this war is no different. I believe that Satan will continue to attack wherever and whenever the gospel is being proclaimed. So this morning, I'm going to take us through Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. And we're going to learn about the divine armor and weapons that God has for every one of his believers. So I'll read the whole passage and then we'll go through it. So it says, <clears throat> starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil... For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And I guess I should have told everybody, my translation is New King James, so I don't know what you guys are reading from, but I have New King James, and I personally don't care about translation as long as you're reading the Bible. So, so we'll start in verse 10. The very first thing Paul tells us is that we need to be strong in the power of the Lord and in the power of His might. So when we live our lives in union with God, we can't be stopped and won't be stopped. The end of John chapter 15 verse 5 says, For without me you can do nothing. Then in verse 11, Paul continues to give us more instruction, which is, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to, to withstand the wiles of the devil. So what does that word wiles mean? It's a weird word. And I'm pretty sure if I didn't know what it meant, most people don't know what it meant unless they've gone and looked in the dictionary. So I brought that to us. It says, um, so the definition of wiles that I found says, devious or cunning strategies employed in manipulating or persuading somebody, someone to do what one wants. So exactly what Satan does. So that's wiles. And I was just thinking about how Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God. How often do we go out unprepared for battle? So I grew up, my father is a Marine, and um, we watched lots of old military uh, movies and new ones. One of my favorites is Black Hawk Down. I don't know if anybody's seen this, this video, but one of my favorites. So anyway, all these Army Rangers and Delta Force are going out on what they call a pretty routine mission. And in one of the scenes, one of the senior soldiers tells one of the junior soldiers, oh, you don't need that, you don't need that. And they leave all this equipment, body armor, night vision goggles, extra canteens and stuff. And well, if you've seen the movie, they get stuck there for a whole day and they could have used the night vision, the armor, the canteens. and. How often does that happen to us? We need to be putting on the whole armor of God, and Paul makes that very clear here. So in, in verse 12, it goes on. It says, um, now, now that we need, know that we need to be wearing God's armor to withstand the attacks from the enemies and his plan of attack, verse 12 tells us who the enemy is. And I think this is an important one that Christians need to remember. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. 
So we are not against our fellow man. How often do we see Christians battling out against non-believers? And what does that do for the gospel message? Or how about Christians battling Christians? What does that do for our gospel message? But against principalities, against powers, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Those are our enemies, not one another. Paul makes it very clear here that we are not against our, our fellow man. Our enemy is spiritual as well as our warfare. You know, I touched on the gay flags in churches. But you know, there's another side of the spectrum. You have the gay flags far on one side. How about the churches that go and pick at gay pride events, abortion clinics with hateful messages? What does that do? What does that do for us? We're not against our fellow man. So there's a very good um, movie that talks about a very good way to get to reach those people. It's about a, an abortion clinic. I won't go in too much detail, but this lady runs an abortion clinic and a Christian group, instead of holding signs, they stand outside this abortion clinic for 30 days and pray. And they pray and they pray and they pray. Well, the lady who ran the abortion clinic was one of the top, top people for Planned Parenthood in Texas and now is one of the biggest voices against abortion. And that is the power of prayer and not hate. So the name of that movie is called Unplanned, if anybody wants to watch it later. Powerful movie, very graphic about the abortions, I'll warn you right now, but a very powerful movie. So Paul goes on and he tells us about the ranks, essentially, the principalities and what's not. So the ranks of Satan army are, are as follows. The principalities would be equivalent to almost a general in, in military terms for us. They have oversight of the nations. And um, so the powers would be the rank of private and they carry out the orders of the principalities. So the rulers of darkness of this age are the ones who have charge over Satan's worldly business. And these could include a lot of things. Government officials on all levels, municipal, provincial, federal, whatever. It could even be leaders in churches. So, and I think we can see these individuals in our society today. Just think about here in North America. We have leaders who swear their oaths of, of office on a Bible. They put their hand on the Bible and swear their oaths. But then, and they claim to be Christians, some of them, but then they allow some very bad things to happen and openly support unbiblical things. And I want to stress right now, I'm not against my fellow man. It may sound like it, but I'm just pointing things out. Um, Satan has used Western governments very successfully to further his agenda. We can look at the gay agenda. For example, it's everywhere. Abortion is becoming more and more accepted. The trans agenda is more and more accepted. And it's getting younger and younger that they're allowing this to get into our schools. Um, they've normalized this in our society. So next is the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. <clears throat> so these are people that Satan has put in charge of religion. And again, in North America or the Western world, we don't have to look far to see this. I talked about all the stuff that I see in downtown churches, but what about the prosperity gospel? Those people do not speak this message but they have huge followings. I mean, if you go into a chapters and you go into the Christian book section, try and find a good evangelical pastor's book in there. It doesn't happen, but you can find Joel Olstein, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer. The, the names go on and on and on. So there's other churches too, and I'm not, or 
We're not online, right, Pastor Tony? Does this go online at all? Yes. Okay, then I'm not going to say the church's name. So there's, there's a so-called church, Christian church in the U.S. And we'll just call it the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizarding, just for, for today's sake. Um, here, they teach their students to do card readings. Um, um, prophesizing but they don't get the, the, the very first test for their prophesizing is, is they get matched up with two people who you don't know their name but you have to prophetically guess their name so lots of unbiblical stuff at this, at this uh, so called Christian school and the worst part about this school is that they actively seek members from good churches to bring them to this school and teach them this nonsense and send them back and infiltrate the church. And they've done a very good job at it. They produce music and all sorts of stuff. And I'm sure everybody here has heard some of their music. So Jesus gives us a, a warning about this type of stuff in Ma Matthew 7 verses 15 to 20. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. <clears throat> we go on to verse 13. Paul proceeds to tell us once again that we should put on the whole armor of God. And again, the whole armor. We do not leave one piece off. So that we can withstand the attacks of the enemy. By Paul telling us this twice, that we need to put on the that we need to put on the full armor of God, it's best not to forget to equip ourselves daily with this. We wouldn't want to be caught unprepared, just like the soldiers in Black Hawk Down. Verse 14. Again, here Paul commands us to stand. So Paul does not give us a command to go out and wage war. So we're not to go out and wage war against Satan and his army. Satan is the one who's going to do the attacking and we are just to withstand those attacks with God's armor. So now we're going to get into all the pieces of the armor. So we have the belt of truth. What is the belt of truth? Well, the belt of truth is Christ. Some may say it's the Word of God. But we can go and we can look at, I'm not going to read this whole bit of scripture, but you guys can go back and look at it later. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, I think, touches on that very well. In verse 1, it talks about the Word and who is the Word. John will then tell us in verse 14 that, it is, that Christ is the Word. But not only that, but that He is the Word, but He is full of grace and truth. So the belt of truth is Christ. So another example of this, in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So to wear the belt of truth, we must invite Jesus into our life as our Lord and Savior and read his word daily. We must study his word diligently after accepting Christ. Because remember, the devil knows Scripture well and uses it to manipulate people all the time. Oh, I just lost my spot, sorry. So he even used it to try and attack Jesus in the desert. And again, I will let you read this later. I will not jump into it too much, but Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. We remember Jesus tempted Christ by trying to use Scripture and Christ countered Satan with Scripture. So if we prize truth above all else, we will be able to deliver decisive blows to Satan and his army. When we wear the belt of truth, this symbolizes that we are ready for battle. In ancient times, which is where Paul got his 
illustration from was an ancient the Roman soldier. When you had the belt on, it would hold all the other gear in place. Final piece that you put on before you went to battle. So the next piece is the breastplate of righteousness. And this is not our righteousness, but rather Christ. And uh, so I'm going to read you from Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 26. And I want you to pay attention to how many times Paul mentions Christ's righteousness in this. But now the righteousness, or sorry, righteousness of God, not just Christ, but, the, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, for there is no difference. For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as appropriation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that He might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So you see, the breastplate will get nowhere with our righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. And without wearing the breastplate, we have little protection. And this is no good because when the, when the soldier put on the breastplate in, in the ancient times, it protected his vital organs. So we must put on our faith daily in Christ so that we may be able to equip, the, equip this breastplate which is so vital to our success. Next in verse 15, we have the preparation of the gospel of peace. Here Paul tells us to shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I think this comes down to the commission that we spoke of at the beginning of the message. The point of footwear in the military is to be able to advance on the enemy. I'm sure Pastor Tony can attest to this. I know I've heard my dad tell me about this. If you're walking long distances, you need good socks and you need good boots. If you don't have good socks and you don't have good boots, your feet become a mess and you go nowhere. So, what's the way that we advance the gospel to others? We, we have another set of orders, which is found in the book of Acts. And it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So my translation for everybody here today would be, you guys are to be Christ's witness in Redwater, then Alberta, and then in Canada to the ends of the earth. And that's my translation to you guys here today. Next, in verse 16, we go on to the shield of faith. Paul tells us to take, to take up the shield of faith, which can quench all the fiery darts. So again, in ancient times, where Paul's getting his imagery from, the shield would be large, and you could stand behind it to withstand archers' attacks when they're attacking from far. So our faith must, be, must remain strong to be safe. If our faith fails, then part of our defense fails. So let's look at some examples of faith that saves. So earlier in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, Paul says, for by, the grace you have, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, you, that none of yourselves is, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So the next piece we have is our helmet of salvation. He says, take the helmet of salvation. Helmets were designed to protect a soldier's head. So the helmet of salvation protects us from the impact of evil, from evil suggestions and impulses, and withstands the attacks knowing that salvation is our crown of assured victory. So our fi the final piece and then, if you'll notice, it's the only offensive weapon that we wield. And that's the sword of the Spirit. 
And what is the sword of spirit? I would say that it's probably the word of God too. This is, this would be the sword of the spirit. The awesome thing about God's word is that it can comfort us when needed. It can convict us of our sin when we need that. And help us destroy the sin that's in our life as well. As I mentioned earlier in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus used, Jesus used um, Scripture to defeat Satan when he was tempted in the desert. But Satan tried to use that weapon against him well as well. This is why we must study Scripture so that we may be able to wield one of the most powerful weapons of all time. Verse 18 says, praying always with prayer, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all per perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So, prayer is our communication with God. That's sort of like radios are used nowadays in the military. You know, we must be in constant communication to understand the enemy's movements. To understand where the enemy is attacking and so on. It's also a huge chance for us to ask for protection just like they do in the military. They can call in airstrikes, they can call in for reinforcements and we can do the same with God. So this is all the equipment and resources God has given us in our daily battle with the enemy. If we are to be victorious in our daily battle, we must put on the whole armor and be strong in Christ Jesus as we are commanded. Some days, it may seem like we're fighting a losing war. And I would say a lot of days when we read the news and see the stuff that's going on, we can feel pretty defeated as Christians. Um, but let's take a moment. I want us to think back. We just had our Remembrance Day, but I want us to think back to World War II and the D-Day battle. <clears throat> See, when the Allies were getting ready to storm the beach, that was pretty much the end of World War II. That was the beginning of the end. Once the Allies landed on the beach, um, the war was won pretty much. They just needed to win the small battles all the way to Berlin, which would eventually fall to the Allies. Likewise, in our spiritual war, Christ has already defeated Satan. That's the great news today. This war, Satan's been defeated. The war has won, is won. And this is why Christian soldiers must not retreat, but stand firm in Christ. We have landed on the beach and we are gaining ground every day till the day Christ returns and ends this all once and for all. Oh, that's right there. So I'm going to read a little blur, uh, piece of scripture from Revelations chapter 19, verse 17 to 21. It says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that ye of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and all who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast... The, king, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked, his, worked signs in his presence, by which he was deceived, those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and the birds were filled with their flesh. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with the hymn, Onward, Christian Soldiers, Marching as to War. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe, Forward into battle, see his banners go. Crowns and thorns may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the cross of Jesus constant will remain. Christ has won this war. We just need to stand firm. If you'd pray with me now as we finish.
Father God, I thank you for this time and I thank you for this opportunity to bring your word forth. And I just pray as we prepare ourselves for this next week and every day that we remember that we need your divine armor, each and every piece of it, to go out and be successful in you, Christ. And I just pray for each and every person here as they battle their own battles that you would help them to be victorious in each and every battle, that they would find their hope in you. We know you've won, and we stand together with you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.